Before Adam comes, we'll go ahead and dismiss for Children's Church. Adam. Alrighty. Am I on, Brother Anderson? Good. Fantastic. Uh, well, I want to thank the praise and worship team for this morning, uh, leading us and singing. I'm grateful to be back here at, at Friendly Community Baptist Church, just having the opportunity to meet uh, the congregation again, um, come together and, and be a part of the singing uh, and the worship. Uh, but most importantly, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to preach, uh, to open up God's Word, uh, to read it, to explain it, uh, and to see how it is applied to our lives and that's exactly what we're going to do this morning. If you would take your Bibles and you would open them up to the book of Psalms. Psalm 85 is where we're going to take our main text for today. Psalm 85 and verse 10. Uh, and while you're turning there, uh, I just want to say thank you to the church. Uh, you all have been friendly and kind uh, as you've always been. Uh, you've treated us very well. Uh, we had a great time at the Valentine's Banquet uh, on Friday night, just getting to meet people and, and enjoy fellowship, uh, play games, and, uh, and just have a good time with one another. Um, and so I just want to say thank you uh, on behalf of myself and my wife just for um, how friendly you guys have been living up to the namesake of the church. Well, by now, I, I hope you found uh, our place for today, Psalm 85. We're going to read verse 10. We're going to pray uh, and get into our message for this morning uh, the psalmist writes, he says, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. We'll pray and get started. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to open up your word this morning. Uh, Lord, thank you that we live in a country where we are free uh, to preach uh, the Bible, uh, to come together and worship you uh, as our Savior and our Lord. Uh, Lord, I do pray that you would be with us this morning. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit, uh, that I would be submitted to him, Lord, in such a way uh, that you hide me behind this pulpit, Lord, and the people hear your words. Uh, Lord, I pray that I would not say one thing uh, that is outside of your will. Lord, help me to say exactly what you want and keep me from saying what I ought not to. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would be with the members of the congregation this morning. Lord, I pray that they too would be submitted to your Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, that their ears would be opened uh, and that their hearts uh, would be willing to receive the, train, the changing truth of your word. Uh, Lord, the Bible is a living book. I pray that it would spark new life in us. Lord, I pray that you would be with us this morning. Lord, I pray that you would be honored, glorified, lifted high, that you would be our focus. Lord, thank you for so great a salvation that you have given to us. And all this we pray in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it would help if I got my notes out, you know. <laughs> there it is. Um, so I've been praying a lot about where the Lord would have me to preach. Uh, I came down believing that I was going to preach something else, and I uh, spent yesterday studying. Uh, and the Lord led me to this passage, uh, Psalm 8510. I'll, I'll read it again because it's so short. The psalmist says, Mercy and truth are met together, uh, righteousness and peace. Uh, have kissed each other. Uh, and so the first thing that I think it's important for us to look at in this text uh, are the requirements of this text. You see, there's a, a couple of different terms uh, that the psalmist uses. He uses terms mercy and truth. Uh, he uses terms righteousness and peace. And it's important for us to understand, uh, one, what these terms mean, but to why they are used. Uh, these, these terms uh, belong within certain requirements. Uh, there is a requirement of God that some of these terms apply to, uh, and there is a requirement that you and I have as people that some of these terms uh, apply to. And so the first requirement I want us to look at is, is the requirement of God, uh, and God requires some very specific things he requires righteousness and justice. 
Those are God's requirements, righteousness and justice. And we, we see this term righteousness in our text. It's one of the terms that fit into God's requirements. You see, God requires righteousness of you and of me. In fact, the Bible commands us to be righteous. If you would take your copy of God's word and turn to the book of 2 Timothy, as Paul is writing to this young pastor and giving him guidance and understanding and how he ought to live and how he ought to act as a pastor, he speaks about this idea of righteousness. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, and, and starting in verse 22, uh, Paul starts into yet another list of uh, guidances for Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, he writes, warning him, he says, flee also youthful lusts, distractions, temptations, sins that would seek to pull you away from the Lord. He says, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness. We are encouraged, we are commanded, we are led by God to follow this idea of righteousness. In fact, not only are we commanded to follow righteousness, I'll turn there for sake of ease, we have a, a lot of passages to look at this morning, but in Proverbs 15 and verse 9, Solomon is, is writing the words of wisdom. In Proverbs 15, 9, he says, The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. The Lord commands us as his sons and daughters, not, not even as his sons and daughters, but as his creation, as human beings made in the image of God, we are commanded to follow after righteousness. And it says that the Lord is pleased. He finds enjoyment. He loveth those that followeth after righteousness. This is God's commandment. It is something he expects us to do, but it's important for us to understand, well, what is righteousness? We can see from the scriptures that we're commanded to be righteous, but what does that mean? What does that like, look like? And the Bible tells us, if we go to the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy, in chapter 6, God gives us an understanding, a definition of what righteousness is. God does not command us to do things uh, and then leave us in the dark as to what those things are or what they look like or how to practice them. Rather, he gives commands and he also gives us understanding, definition with those things. It's exactly what he does in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. The final verse, verse 25, Moses writes, the Lord really is speaking through Moses. He says, and it shall be our righteousness. There's that word again. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do what? All these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Righteousness, true biblical righteousness is obedience to God's commands. The Bible describes the Lord God as our lawgiver. He dictates what our lives as his creation ought to look like. And so righteousness is obedience to God's commands. In other words, it is not just an obedience to his commands, but a conformity to his nature. God is righteous. And for us to be righteous, it means that we take on some of the characteristics of God's nature. In fact, in the same book that we're in, Deuteronomy, if you would turn over to chapter 32, a few chapters ahead, Deuteronomy 32, we see God's nature described that if we are going to be righteous, that we must follow after. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. The Lord God has described Deuteronomy 32, 4. It says, he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth, one of our terms again from our text, and without iniquity, just and right 
is he. He is righteous, and he must do justly. Remember, we said that God's requirements are two things, righteousness and justice. In fact, righteousness demands justice. If righteousness is to be what it is, obedience to God's commands, justice must necessarily follow after it. What do I mean by that? God's holy nature means that unrighteousness must be punished. When we fail to be righteous, when we fail to do as Deuteronomy 6 says, to keep all of God's laws and commandments, we receive not the title righteous, but the title unrighteous, lawbreaker. And as a result, God must pour out justice upon us. The Bible tells us what this justice is. In Romans 6.23, the Bible tells us that the wages for sin is what? Death. You all know it, right? Justice for our unrighteousness means that we must be punished with death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. And the truth is that justice for unrighteousness does not end at death. If you would, turning your Bibles to Psalm 9. Psalm 9 and verse 17. Not only do we suffer death as a result of our unrighteousness, but in Psalm 9 and verse 17... David writes of yet another bit of God's justice towards unrighteousness. He describes those that fail to keep God's law as wicked. And in Psalm 9, 17, he says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. You see, because God is holy, because God is righteous, because God is sinless, he is also just. He must punish sin in order for him to be the God that he is. He cannot let unrighteousness simply continue without being addressed. And so the justice that God requires demands that as sinners... We must experience spiritual death. And as sinners, we must be separated from God eternally in hell after we die. Those are God's requirements. But our text also has other terms. If you're in the book of Psalms, go ahead and turn back to our text. Look what it says, Psalm 85.10. Not only is righteousness listed in there, but it says that mercy and truth are met together and that righteousness and peace have kissed each other. God requires righteousness and justice as a result of our sin, but we require mercy and peace. God requires righteousness and justice. We require mercy and and peace. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 3. We'll see our requirements laid out in the pages of Scripture. Galatians 3, 22. I appreciate you keeping up with me. I know we're turning a lot of places this morning, uh, but the reason for that is because I want you to understand that this isn't my word or my opinion on something. This is God's truth, and as such, it ought to pierce and apply into our hearts and our lives. Galatians 3 and Verse 22, we get a description of ourselves. It says in Galatians 3.22, But the scripture hath concluded, it has come to the conclusion that all are under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. You know what the Bible says? That all of us, are under sin. That every single person falls short of God's standard and requirement of righteousness. 
What does Romans 3.23 say? For all have sinned and done what? Come short of the glory of God. Come short of his holiness. Come short of his requirement of righteousness. You see, our truth, that term that we read in the text, the truth that defines us as unrighteous, as under sin, it destroys our peace with God. The peace that we require with God is destroyed as a result of the truth that pertains to our lives. For as Galatians says, the scriptures have concluded all under sin. You see, our sin alienates us from God and pronounces us as his enemy. I'm not going to turn to these passages now. We'll come back to them later on in the message. But Romans 5.10 quite literally calls us the enemy of God. Colossians 1 and, and, and verse 21 goes farther than that, not just calling us an enemy, but saying that we are alienated, separated from God as a result of the truth of our lives. There's not a person living in this world that has not come short of God's standard of righteousness. For as we saw in Deuteronomy, righteousness is keeping all the law. And yet, each and every one of us has sinned, and in all honesty, does continue to sin every day of our lives. Our unrighteousness incurs God's wrath on us as sinners. Turn, if you would, to the book of Romans. Ephesians calls us children of wrath as a result of our sin. Look what Romans says. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul has just describing how those who would be just must live by faith. Then we get to verse 18 of Romans 1, and look and see the sobering truth that Paul writes. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and un." righteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. God's wrath, his righteous anger, his just temperament against sin is poured out on those that bear the title of unrighteous. What that means is that you and I as unrighteous people have incurred God's justice, and wrath upon us as a result of our actions. And so our unrighteousness pleads for mercy and peace. God requires righteousness, and we have fallen short of it. And as a result, justice is stored up against us in the form of death and hell and God's wrath. Then on the other side of the gap, we require mercy and peace with God as a result of our unrighteousness that has separated us from God and pronounced us as his enemy. Because of our sin, our only hope to escape death and hell and the wrath of God is to beg for mercy. To say as David does with David in Psalm 51 and verse 1, have mercy upon me, O God. These are the requirements in which the terms of our passage must fit into. But if we turn back to our text, Psalm 85 and verse 10, we see that, yes, these are the requirements into which the terms of our text fit, but they have a relationship with each other. Not only are there requirements, but there is also a reconciling. These terms require being put together, right? If we look at Psalm 8510, it describes relationships between these terms. It says that mercy what we require, 
and the truth about us, our unrighteousness, the fact that we have fallen short of God, that they are met together. It says that righteousness, God's requirement, and peace, our requirement, have kissed each other. Somewhere, these opposing requirements, these opposites, come together in a union. Somewhere, these opposites must meet. This is reconciling. To reconcile is to cause to coexist in harmony. To take two parties that are separated and opposite from each other and to bring them together in such a way that both sides fit. That both sides are satisfied. And yet, there is an impossibility for this reconciliation. As a sinner, I cannot be served both God's justice and God's mercy. Justice is receiving what I ought to receive as a result of my actions. Mercy is not receiving what I ought to receive as a result of my actions. I cannot both receive what I ought and not receive what I ought. They're opposites. They cannot come together. They cannot be reconciled in me. And yet both of them are requirements. And the passage says that both of them come together somehow. How can this impossibility of reconciliation occur? How can punishment happen and mercy happen? There must be a fulfillment of the impossible. For our text says that mercy and truth are met together. That righteousness and peace have kissed one another. Yes, it is impossible for us to reconcile these things together. And yet reconciliation did happen. There is a man in which mercy and truth can be met together. And his name is Jesus Christ. There is a place where righteousness and peace have kissed. It is upon an old rugged cross on a hill that you and I refer to as Calvary. And in that place of Calvary, upon that cross, in that man, Jesus Christ, the impossible happens. Reconciliation occurs. Both God's requirements are met and our requirements are met. God's justice and satisfied, and yet we also become re- recipients of God's mercy. Look and see what the scripture says. Turn again to the book of Romans. Romans 3, we see that God's justice must be satisfied and that it was upon the cross. Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. Look what the apostle Paul writes. Look how he describes the satisfaction of God's justice. In Romans 3 and verse 25, the apostle writes, he says, Whom God, referring to Christ, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. That word means a satisfactory payment. A payment that met the amount that was required. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through forbearance to God. That verse is saying that he puts forth his son, Jesus Christ, the sinless God-man, as a satisfactory payment for our sins. God's justice that is required is not poured out into you and me, but is poured out into his sinless son so that we might be given his righteousness. Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God's justice is satisfied on the cross, though it is not satisfied in me, for I cannot satisfy it and live. It is satisfied in the man, Jesus 
Christ. Look and see what the Old Testament says about him. This isn't simply a, a, a New Testament concept. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah 53, a, a chapter that we often frequent when discussing our Savior and discussing his relationship with the Father. I, Isaiah 53, verses uh, 10 through 12. Look and see the satisfaction of God's holy justice. Isaiah 53 and verse 10 The word of God says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him, that is Jesus Christ, to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant Justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, the sinners, and he bare the sin of many, and made an intercession for the transgressors. An intercession is one who goes between. It says that he was made an intercessor for the transgressors. Is another word for those who are unrighteous, those who are sinners. In other words, it's saying that Jesus Christ stands between us and God. And that as God goes to pour out his holy wrath against sin as a righteous and just and holy God, that Jesus Christ stands in the way of that wrath and willingly takes it on himself, though he never did anything wrong, so that we who are unrighteous and are transgressors might escape God's wrath and justice on sin. The Bible says that not only does Christ take on our sin, but in the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, it says that he quite literally becomes our sin. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, the author writes, he says, For he hath made him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, Though Christ himself never did anything wrong, he not only takes on your and my unrighteousness, but he becomes our unrighteousness for us. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ's reconciling work on the cross takes our title of unrighteousness and takes his title of righteous and swaps the two. Those who are undeserving and unworthy and have given up on any ability to ever be called righteous as a result of our sin are granted that title as a gift through Christ's shed blood on Calvary. God's justice is satisfied. His requirement is met. And we become recipients of mercy. Our requirement is met. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where I just was, verse 19 says, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing, not applying their trespasses, their sins, their unrighteousness unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Christ has done the impossible and brought the opposing forces of mercy and justice together at one moment, at the pinnacle of human history, to open the door of salvation to you and to me this morning morning. We looked at two passages earlier, Romans 5 and Colossians 1. Let me read them to you real quick to understand that we have indeed become recipients of God's mercy. Romans uh, chapter 5 verses 6 through 10, it says, for when we were yet without strength, 
when it was impossible for us to ever follow God in the way that we are demanded to follow God. When it was impossible, we had no strength to be righteous and keep all of God's commandments. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the unrighteous. Christ died for me. Christ died for you and for every being that would ever exist on this planet, Christ not only takes on their sin, but becomes their sin, dying for them, dying for us. He says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth, displays, gives his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet unrighteous, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Turn over one final place, Colossians, a verse I referenced earlier and said we would come back to. Colossians chapter 1. We'll read verses 21 and 22. Paul is, is speaking in Colossians 1 and verse 21 he says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies, the two words we talked about earlier, you that sometimes were separated and enemies in your mind by, wic by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. He says, you that were far away from God, Enemies, as a result of your sin, are reconciled. You have been given a new title. You have the opportunity at a new position with God to be presented holy, sinless, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. It is Christ and Christ alone who does the impossible work of reconciliation. And I meet many people in this world that say, Adam, I believe I'm going to heaven because I do my best to be a good person. Adam, I'm going to heaven because I've been baptized. Adam, I'm going to heaven because I, I prayed a prayer at one point in my life. And the truth is you cannot have both requirements met. You cannot be unrighteous and be righteous. And God demands perfection. The only way to be brought close to him is through the one that claims to be the way, the truth, and the life. It is only through Jesus Christ that we can be saved today. It is only by looking to the cross where he shed his sinless blood in our place, where he took on God's wrath in our place, that we can be born again. On the cross, he offers to us his own garment of righteousness as he puts on our own filthy rags of sin. At the cross, he offers to us the adoption as sons and daughters of God as he embraces our own title as enemy of God. At the cross, he offers to us mercy with the Father as he is rejected and forsaken as the object of God's wrath. That is the beauty of the cross, that when Christ hangs on it and says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That the answer that God can give is because I love these people more. I am willing and ready to give up my own blameless son in order to open a door to a relationship with the sinners and the unrighteous and the ungodly people that live in this world. I am willing to forsake my son Jesus to have the opportunity to embrace those that crucified him, those that bear 
the sins that he literally becomes on the cross. He says, I'm willing to forsake my son to have a relationship with you. And it only comes by looking to the Savior at Calvary. It is Christ, it is the cross, which are the impossible fulfillment of our text. Jesus is the reason that mercy and truth are met together. Christ and Calvary are the reason that peace and righteousness can come together and kiss. It is the sacrifice on Calvary which enables us to look to a hill where justice and mercy embrace. There are requirements, but there is a reconciling. And it brings us to a result. These terms must prompt us to action. We are left with two questions. The first question is, has the truth of this verse, the bringing together of opposites, reached your own heart yet? Not just your mind, but your heart. The sad truth is that there are many Christians, well, I shouldn't say that, there are many people that sit in churches and they hear, they know up here what Christ has done, but the truth of his taking their place at the cross has never made it to here. They know what Christ did for them, but they've never sought to have it applied to their own life. They've never given their life to the Lord. They know the truth, but they do not live the truth. They know that the Bible calls Jesus both Savior and Lord, but to them, he has yet to become either Savior or Lord. That's the first question. Has the truth of reconciliation reached your own heart this morning? Do you have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know for sure that if you were to breathe your last breath, that you're going to heaven? Is he Savior and Lord here, or is he Savior and Lord here? The second question is, with whom are you sharing the truth of this passage? The Bible commands us, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the truth that he made the unrighteous righteous, that he made those who must suffer justice to receive mercy. Our job is to bring that truth to a lost and dying world, to our co-workers who are on their way to hell, to our friends who are spiritually dead, to our own family members that are presently rejecting Jesus Christ. That is what we are called to do as Christians. That is the purpose, the mission of the church. With whom are you sharing it? With whom do you need to share it? And so as we come to the end of our service, if I would have everyone's heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask Brother Denny to come to the piano and just play a little bit in the background. I want you to contemplate these two questions. Do you know for sure that you are going to heaven? Are you a Christian in word? Or are you a Christian in your life? Has the truth of this verse reached your heart yet? Has there been a time in your life where you have accepted Jesus Christ as the only satisfactory payment for God's justice and the only vehicle through which you can receive the mercy of God? Quite simply, I'm asking, are you saved? Truly, honestly, a son or daughter of God. And if you can't say, Adam, I am, if there's doubt in your heart, then with everyone's heads and with everyone's, with everyone's heads bowed and with everyone's eyes closed, I'd encourage you merely to come forward this morning, whether it's myself or someone else in the church will meet you and speak with you and show you from the pages of Scripture not how you can earn your own salvation, but how Christ earned it for you on the cross and now offers it to you as a free gift. 
You can escape God's wrath, hell, and spiritual death by embracing the gift of Calvary and the reconciliation, the bringing together that Christ offers you. I'll offer once again the second question. Who do you need to pray for this morning? Who needs to know the truth of the gospel? What family members do you have that are on their way to hell? What friends do you have that do not know Jesus as Savior? This is a time of invitation. It is an invite, an open one, to come and to pray here at the altar for those that need to accept Christ as Savior. And I'm not saying you have to come forward. You can make your own seat, a time to pray to the Lord. But who in your life has yet to experience this glorious truth of impossible odds being brought together in one man? Who do you know that needs to be saved? Please take some time to pray for them this morning. I'll read one more verse as you all are praying and our service will draw to a close. It's a verse we're very familiar with and yet it is the culmination of everything we've spoken about this morning. A man named Nicodemus comes to Jesus inquiring how he can have this salvation, how this impossible can occur. And he asks Jesus how the impossible can occur. And Christ responds in John chapter 3 and verse 16. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, anyone, everyone that believeth in him as the only payment for their sins should not perish but have everlasting life. Heavenly Father, as we bring our service to a close this morning, I want to thank you for so great a salvation. Lord, I want to thank you for the impossible work of reconciliation, Lord, that you have done for me and the people in this room this morning. Lord, I thank you that while I could not meet your requirements, and Lord, while your justice and holiness prevented you from meeting mine, Lord, that your son came because he loved me, because he loved the people in this world, and he stood in our way to take your wrath and your justice. Lord, I pray that your work on the cross would be ever-present in our minds, that we would live our lives, Lord, as adopted sons and daughters of you, and that we would carry forth the message of the gospel to those that we know that need it most. Lord, thank you for the time to explore your word this morning. I know it was a message on the gospel, but Lord, we need to be reminded of it and hear it often. Lord, thank you for the chance to open up your word and speak. Lord, I pray you be with us for the rest of the day. Thank you for this Sunday. And all this we pray, Lord, in the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Carl. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate that. Um, once again, we do have a uh, meet and greet um, over in the fellowship hall. Um, please stay. Everyone is invited. Um, eat some food and uh, get to know Adam and Julie a little better. We'll go ahead and pray for the food while we're here, um, and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for the message from your word this morning, God, um, for the reconciliation we have in Christ Jesus, Lord, and the peace that that brings, Father. Thank you. God, we pray that you would just bless the food that we're about to eat this morning, Father, and the time of fellowship that we're going to have. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.